This is the Nightshade Cult, a podcast macabre. We bid you welcome. Enter freely and of your own will. I'm Nick Grimm. And I'm David Graves. We will be your horror hosts for this dissection of Joe Johnston's 2010 gothic horror, The Wolfman. Good evening. What did you think of this? This was a crazy movie. This is a crazy movie. And so th- I went on a whole journey because... Uh, of the three movies that we're going to be covering in in this series, this was the only one I had seen. This is I had not seen this movie. Yeah, so. and um, I didn't like it in 2010. I had a real negative reaction to this movie, um, and I was like, I don't like the that that new Wolfman. And it's and I've kind of held on to that, and I've never rewatched mm-hmm. it. And then it's grown and kind of accumulated a cult following, and it comes up when you talk to people about monster movies. They're like, the 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 Benicio del Toro Wolfman is pretty good. And I'm like, no, I I don't like that movie. And they're like, why? And I go, I I don't really remember. I just didn't like it. Yeah, uh, I I mean, I didn't have any preconceived yeah. notions about this, and I like it now. Like I, I'll say, I did a complete about face on it. I like this movie quite a bit. I was like, what was I thinking 13 years ago? I don't really even know what was different about my my view. I mean, you've done you've done a lot of critical movie watch movie watching between then and now. Oh yeah, yeah. Um so probably just that. Just the depth of of knowledge you and, can appreciate and experience. for what, re, appreciate it for what it is, not for what you want it to be. That's a big thing, right? Because that that uh, expectation is the thief of joy, or, mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, when you have a when you have something built up as like this is what I this is what this is going to be, and this is what I want it to be, mm-hmm. and then it isn't that thing. You're like fuck this. Anthony Hopkins shouldn't be a werewolf. Yeah. <laughs> and, you're, and you're like I, I'm leaving. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, it looked really cool to me. Like it, I immediately was drawn in right from the very beginning, mm-hmm. just, just from the appearance of the movie. It yeah. just has a really great Gothic horror look. It is like in a weird way, this movie, um, this would be a better companion to Bram Stoker's oh, Dracula yeah. than Wolf was. This is so much better with Bram Stoker's Dracula. The, yeah. this, the style is so similar. Yeah. The era is similar. Yeah. It's just really, it's, it, it, was a, it was a true gothic horror, and, yeah. I, and I like that style. Yeah, you, you can tell, I mean, it's something that people talk about, but you can, also, you can just see it that that was one of, the, one of the big influences on this movie, like was to do... Do the Wolfman the way Coppola did Dracula. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and th- I mean they did some really cool, um, really cool things with the sets and the the the, the way they filmed them. But we'll get into that mm-hmm. uh, as we uh, as we go forward. Um, so, did you want to get into our dark tidings? Yeah, let's something do that. For us, here. Let's see here. if we can see if I can outroll you on initiative here. Oh, I got a 17. I got a 10, so you go first. Okay, so this episode is about werewolves, but um, I couldn't find anything cool about werewolves, but I did find something cool about vampires, and Uh they're better anyway, so here we go. (laughs) So you're going to balance it out. Yeah, Yeah. we're going to balance the meter. Um, So you know know I've been a big fan of um, the vampire the masquerade property since right. i was a teenager and, and you too um well there was that original vampire the masquerade bloodlines video game that w- was put out and it's a total mm-hmm. classic it's it's amazing yeah that's um, people still play that game yeah. like it has a big fan following well in 2019 they um they released a uh a tra- or a trailer an announcement it was mm-hmm. more like an animatic or something not yeah. really a gameplay for bloodlines 2 yeah um it I was remember supposed that. to come out in 2020 mm-hmm. well here we are <laughs> in 2023 in 2023 in vapor yeah so um Basically, what happened was um, the the owners of the of the um, the IP, mm-hmm. the license, Paradox Entertainment, they ended up having to um, drop the developer that they that they were working with, which was Hard Suit Labs. Okay, um, and they ended up picking up a new developer, which was just recently released. Which is it's a it's a develop a British firm called the Chinese Room. Okay, um, which I thought was a really weird name for uh, for a, a, 
a British game developing lab. Yeah. But so I looked it up to figure out what it is. It's, and it's a famous philosophical argument. Okay. Uh, that, that has to do with, uh, humans being, uh, the human mind being a language processing, um, computer and comparing that to AI processing mm -hmm. computer, uh, com processing language, etc. Okay. And the thrust of it is that there's something different about the way humans process language that code cannot replicate. Okay. And it's a whole wormhole, yeah. rabbit hole of philosophical arguments. So it's kind of a cool niche name for yeah. a, a thing, but it sounds weird. It's one of those things, I, you hear something like that and I think, well, that's clearly a reference and I don't know to what. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so this, this game had, or this company has picked it up and there's a new, new trailer out and um, they've promised an early 2024 release. I'm not going to believe that yeah. uh, at all, but maybe sometime in 2024. When did the first Bloodlines <clears throat> come out? I think 2004. Yeah. Okay. It was pretty far, maybe 2006. It was it was a long, long time, time ago. ago. Yeah. Um, and they uh, you know they had a big reveal. One of the new cl one of the starting clans you get to play. It's the Bruja. Yeah. Okay. Everybody knows you're going to get to play a Bruja. Mm -hmm. Come on. If you can't play one of the main clans of the Camarilla, it's not a Bloodlines game. <laughs> so they got to give us something a little better than that because that's that's really simplistic. Um, and you can't really tell us, you know, oh, we're telling you about their disciplines. They have the most common disciplines, really. Yeah. So... Uh, maybe they're just going alphabetical. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, I'm just... Uh, I'm I'm... I don't, I'm not going to say I'm super excited about it because I don't believe in, in getting excited for these vaporware games. Mm -hmm, no. I've learned my lesson the hard way. Looking at you, Star Citizen, uh, <laughs> still not out. Um, it was so funny. I, uh, man, Star Citizen. Oh, yeah, we have a feature complete single player game. That's not at all what we kickstarted. We didn't even ask for a single player game. We wanted New Eve. <laughs> it didn't happen yeah. anyway so that's what i got i got some cool video game uh news that i thought was interesting and fun and and i think and i hope most people are uh stoked for this game yeah i i saw that same announcement and i saw that um i must follow follow the game or something follow paradox yeah probably something like that because i saw the announcement and sort of like the the write-up on on the bruja clan and i was yeah. like like oh okay this is moving along and I didn't realize it had been a full three years mm -hmm. since the since the last news, but um, that's good. Yeah, like you, I will uh, remain open minded and ready to to be impressed when it comes. Yeah, maybe yeah. maybe it'll be great. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> um, so my news is between the last step, time we recorded last episode and this one, the SAG strike concluded. Oh yeah, that's a big one. A hundred and eighteen days. Um, the studios finally uh, came around on on some of like their ridiculous things they were insisting on, like uh, like extras giving up their likeness rights um, even after even after, after they die. Even after they die, like basically, you do a background scene in a movie and they own you as a background character for the rest of eternity, and and just just absurd absurd things that no one should have to agree to do yeah um the studio finally caved on a lot of that stuff and they came to a contract um last week and uh went the this past friday to get approved and actors are back in work so oh, that's good the, the writer's strike had concluded a week or two prior to this one and so hollywood's back in business and you know why that really matters because they're actually making the Highlander movie. I was hoping you'd bring that up. Yeah. It's not on my news thing, but that's literally like the most exciting thing about the strike ending. I was like, yes, they're doing it, Chad. <laughs> yeah. Unite. Well, it's Ch it you is Ch yeah. When, so when, uh, when. I mean, Chad Stahelski is this Chad. And then, uh -huh. you know, and then, he's yeah. a Chad. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Cavill's a Chad also, he's, an honorary he, Chad. Yeah, he, yeah, he's kind of like the role model for Chads. Yeah. So, yeah, I so uh, when Stahol Stahalski mentioned that Highlander was was starting to come together, like when he did an interview, like a maybe a month or so ago, and mm -hmm. I was like, 
Oh, like that's that's a real thing. Direct from his mouth, not like not some announcement from a production company. Mm -hmm. He's like talking about I'm actively working on this. And then when they came out that it it's moved into active production instead yeah. of instead of pre-production or whatever, it's like, "Oh, they're really going to make that Highlander movie." Yeah, it's, it's supposed to come out in 2025. Yeah, and they um and they not to do a whole tangent on Highlander Stahalski also said they're using the Queen songs. Yes, like he was, that's super important. <laughs> it's like because it can't. It's just not Highlander without the Queen songs. Y you need them there. They're yeah. too good. They're too good to ignore. Did you have another one? Because I only had the one. No, the one I, piece. I only had the one. There's it's a slow. It's a slow uh, news week. You know, yeah. there's nothing big going on. I right think now that'll probably change. Now that the strikes are over. We'll have a lot more entertainment news. Yeah, I mean, we could talk very briefly about the modern horror phenom. Uh, kids movie five nights at freddy's oh yeah let's let's talk about that because cult cultists you need to probably weigh in on this i suggested we do an episode on five nights at freddy's and i said hell no yeah david was adamant no let's not do that um i have a, a curious mentality i kind of mm -hmm. want to know what the phenomenon is about because um, it did huge numbers yeah and it didn't just do huge box office numbers. It did huge numbers while you could stream it at home. Yeah. Um, so you didn't have to go to the theater, but the fandom chose to go to the theater to go see it. Yeah. Um, so that's a serious fandom. And it has been, I mean, I think the game is like 20 years old. Yeah, it's a, it's an old game. Yeah. I've seen people cosplaying these, oh, yeah. these characters it for two decades. Legs. Yeah. So I'm... I've always been a little baffled by the Five Nights at Freddy's phenomenon, but, and so I'm a little curious about it. And here's the it. reason I gave it the hard veto. It's because it, it does have a, a very strong fandom, and mm -hmm. there's like there's a bunch of people who really like it, did great numbers and all of that. But the people that are into it are not my demo. <laughs> it would be like if there was a Roadblocks movie or, yeah. or a Minecraft movie. A yeah. Minecraft movie would crush the box office. I still give zero fucks. Yeah. Uh, Five Nights at Freddy's is the same thing. It's a kid's game with a kid's fandom. And so, yeah, 20 years have passed. Some of those kids are now adults. Yeah, they're full on. Yeah. But it's, it's just, uh, it's like... I wasn't a kid when that thing was new and and precious. Mm -hmm. it, I have no connection to it, so it's like I don't know. It's kind of like how old oldies look at the Harry Potter adult fans. They're like, yeah. that was an all right story, but I don't know about tattoos and molding your life around it. Yeah, um, it, it it's a fandom that is for kids. Kids ten fifteen years ago, but. Mm -hmm. It's still not a fandom for me. I'm just not interested in it. Okay, I'm ambivalent, yeah. but I if uh, if David wasn't so hard against it, or if the if the cultists come out in in force and say no, we love Five Nights at Freddy's, then maybe we'll, we'll okay. Move a I'll go bit. ahead and put this out there. So when we put this out on YouTube, we're gonna mm -hmm. put because that's our most popular pr platform by far. Is it really? Yeah. All the platforms, YouTube is the most popular. If I can get, uh, let's say, five unique people that aren't you or or, <laughs> or your wife or or, or, or yeah, uh, if, if five I, five unique commenters, just five yeah. on that video on this video, okay, um, we will we, we, I'll cave. We'll do Five Nights at Freddy's, no problem. Okay. They got to be Only real. Only five. five. Well, yeah. five. I guess it's it's numerically significant to the fandom. Well, it will, it's five. Yeah, five nights at Freddy. Five comments for uh, FNAF, as I've come, you know, <laughs> to think of it. There's, the, yeah, five five for five. Let's let's do it. And and I know we have enough uh, uh, cultists out there that that listen on the on YouTube mm -hmm. uh, on the regular. It's just it's up to you. Don't comment to troll me. <laughs> comment if you it's want on, that episode it's on your honor <laughs> yeah i mean if you comment to troll me that's fine i respect yeah. the game but <laughs> you know <laughs> you know what there also is is uh what's it called willie's wonderland which is a similar concept it's a nick cage movie huh where similarly he's fighting the animatronics inside of a a, a Chuck E. cheese-esque restaurant now that sounds up my alley I'm yeah <laughs> <laughs> and i've i mean because you know how whenever something comes out 
uh, there'll be like a clickbait article that will be like, actually, uh, Willy's Wonderland did this better 10 years ago mm -hmm. or whatever. So then I was like, well, I actually used to get Willy's Wonderland and Five Nights at Freddy's confused <laughs> because I was like, how many things about like evil Chuck E. Cheese can there be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if we get 10 comments, we'll also oh, do, we'll Will do that one We'll too. do Willy's Wonderland. Or, or just, just uh, Cultists, if you just, just comment on here which one you want us to do, yeah. uh, Five Nights at Freddy's or Willy's Wonderland, if either of them get five, we'll do that one. Okay. That's fair. If I, you if both get five, we do both. I know that uh, Cultist Ted and Cultist James are huge Nick Cage fans, both of them. So, Oh, yeah, I love Nick, Nick Cage. He's like, he's... He is a, um, he, he's like an, I don't know. He's, he's like an edge lordy weird guy that, yeah. uh, that I can really just get behind. Like seeing a picture of him, like lounging around in an all leather outfit with like <laughs> a chain choker and yeah. a cowboy hat. I'm like, yeah, that guy's cool. And that's just him on a Tuesday. He is, uh. He's a real interesting guy. He's a Coppola too, actually. Is he? <laughs> yeah, he's because yeah, that's he's actually from the the Coppola family. He changed his name to not be a nepo baby. Oh, okay. Well, that's cool. I, I I respect that. Yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and take a break, and then we'll come back with this dissection of the Wolfman. After the savage killing of his brother, a touring actor returns to the English estate of his long-estranged father to pay his respects and to uncover the mystery of his brother's killer. Unfortunately for him, his brother was killed by a lycanthrope, and when he survives his own encounter with it, it passes its curse onto him. Yeah, that's uh, the the beginning of this movie really threw me for a loop. Like the whole the he's a, he's a traveling actor did mm -hmm. you think they did that just because his he doesn't do a good british accent because mm. the character is supposed to be english right no so that is, that um that lawrence talbot has spent most of his life in america is a carryover from the from, Ford, the, from the 41 yeah um they they zhuzh up the original because it's a it's like a 75 minute movie with credits mm -hmm. it's it's very short um, so they expand on a lot of the characters and, and expand on, on, uh, some of the ideas, Yeah. but, um, the American son returning home to the UK to his, to his father's estate is the premise of the original Wolfman also. Okay. I was just wondering about that, but I really like, I really like the, um, the estate that they chose, the yeah. set is just absolutely stunning. Was that Chatworth House? I think it's called. And I love how how they they really just use the property to the best of its ability yeah. with the with the uh, the house in the background and so many shots. It just mm -hmm. looks it just looks awesome. And it's one of those old, you know, British manor houses uh, that just looks so imposing, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, the Lord lives up there. Uh, and all the people in the village are, you know, sort of figuratively and literally down beneath him. It's a, uh, it's ominous. Yeah, it's it's really cool. Yeah, um, I think that one of the one of the things, kind of going to that, um, the way it looks and all of that. Um, what I'm getting at is the atmosphere of this movie. I really feel like the, I think Johnston does a really good job of constantly creating this. Uh, sense of unease mm -hmm. and uh, foreboding all yeah. the time. Uh, just it just uh, the, it, you always feel like something bad is going to happen. Yeah, there's a creeping dread mm -hmm. that happens constantly, and um, you know uh, Lawrence and his father Sir John um, Del Toro and Anthony Hopkins um, is so much unspoken tension mm -hmm. between them. You know, like. There's this real like malevolence to Sir John, 
but not in the things that he says generally. Like he's saying the nice, kind things, but he has this predatory um Yeah, his eyes vibe. His eyes are definitely not kind. Yeah. And it's there's um both of them, Del Toro and Hopkins, do a ton of eye acting. Like mm-hmm. not spoken, just like portraying silently the tension between them. Yeah. And anybody, any of you cultists out there that have a, a strained relationship with your father, this is pretty legit. It's a pretty good p- portrayal of it. Yeah. 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 Where you, you say the right things. I'm glad to see you. Nobody's glad. <laughs> no one's glad to see you. <laughs> Neither of you want this to go down. <laughs> yeah, if 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 I wasn't if it wasn't that I was close by, and my sister in law, my future sister in law, reached out to me, and my brother had died, the proximity to the timing, every everything has conspired to force me to come mm-hmm. here. I could not get out of it. Yeah, Lawrence was not stoked to be there. Yeah, which we find as we go on, he has good reason not to want to be there. Yeah. He has very troubled childhood. Yeah, his mother uh his mother he he has these visions of his mother committing suicide while he was there mm-hmm. and he was his, his father had him institutionalized after yeah. the mother's death and um it was uh, very troubling for him. He wants nothing to do with Talbot Manor. Yeah, and since we're not you know concerned about spoilers it, he he didn't witness his mother's suicide. He witnessed the aftermath of his father murdering his mother. Yeah, and then he was convinced that it was suicide. They, yeah, they like forced him to believe that through like shock therapy and like you know like ice dunking and all of this uh, extreme Victorian uh, you know sanatorium practices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's wild. It's a uh, this is a it's a grim movie. <laughs> yeah, very, yeah, very grim. Yeah, I, I think that Johnston does a great job with pacing. Actually, mm-hmm. normally I really complain about pacing in these movies. Yeah, um, but I think that he uh, he keeps uh, he keeps it going, yeah. even though it's intentionally um, very well timed reveals, slowly pulling back the curtain. Because mm-hmm. in the beginning of the movie, you you think his mother committed suicide. You, yeah. you, you think the vision is real and mm-hmm. you don't you don't have any idea that Sir John is a werewolf. Yeah. And you have no idea that um you know any of this is going going on. And it just you get the slow unraveling of mm-hmm. this story and it feels like a twist yeah and then a twist and then a twist and i'm like man this is good like it was pretty engrossing the way he unravels it i think it is really well well paced and when you know the when you know the twist like any any movie that has a twist um it's foreshadowed constantly yeah yeah, right that, that john talbot is a is a werewolf yeah because um he's always wearing furs Right, yeah. and his house is like a beast den, and it's filled with trophies of all of his kills. Like yeah. the hallways are lined with animal heads. There's furs everywhere. Like it's this con- like constant reminder that he is a killer. Yeah. Um. And so yeah, it's like oh yeah, they've been telling me the whole time that well, he was when, that he was the beast. Uh, when Lawrence like talks to Singh, mm-hmm. the he calls him his Sikh manservant. Yeah, he's an Indian guy, and yeah. Singh has silver bullets because there's you know there's a werewolf on the prowl in the in the lands, and, and yeah. they know what's up, and yeah. uh, Singh knows what's up, and so he's like loading the bullets. I'm like, it didn't occur to me. I'm like, why does Singh have silver bullets? <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, it's to kill Sir John if he yeah. gets crazy. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, again, no spoilers. Uh, yeah, Sir John sabotaged those bullets. They don't yeah. work. He took- R- R.I.P. Singh. He yeah. was a real one. <laughs> they didn't show enough damn Singh. I liked that character. I wanted more Singh. Yeah. Can we get a Singh prequel? <laughs> <laughs> I would watch yeah. that. Werewolf Hunter of India? That would be dope. Honestly, you know, I'm okay. I, uh, let's Let's pitch this here for a second. <laughs> Sir, the the story of how Sir John became a werewolf, where he's yeah, he tells the, the story verbally to Lawrence, and yeah. it's engrossing, like it's yeah. captivating. Yeah, and it's uh, it's 
it's slightly reminiscent of the plot of Werewolf of London. There's mm-hmm. a, this movie is filled with homages to like every werewolf movie. Yes. Um, where the the werewolf in Werewolf of London, it, it was a similar story, but it was Tibet instead of India. Yeah. But you could tell the story of Sir John, who's you know one of those English big game hunter guys from that century, um, and him going to India to hunt tigers and yeah, like yeah. that whole thing that would make a whole great adventure and you movie. Know who should star in it? Nick Cage. <laughs> he can, he can. As the werewolf that lives in the cave. <laughs> no, it's Talbot. He can't be young, Sir John. He's okay, old okay, now. Okay, no. You the, need a, Nick Cage is the werewolf, but we have uh, we have Keanu play. Uh, he's too old. Too. He can play young. He's he's immortal. How about uh, Nick Holt? Nick Holt's young enough. No, how about that youngest Skarsgård? Bill that, Skarsgård? That played the bad guy in the last John Wick movie? Yeah, Bill Skarsgård. Yeah, Bill Skarsgård. That'd be a good As a one. young Anthony Hopkins. Yeah. yeah. He's Maybe, got that intense look. Yeah. Those, those lonely eyes. Dev Patel as as the young Singh. Oh, yeah. That'd be great. Oh, yeah. Okay, so give we'll us, just... Give I us can, money. We'll, we'll do, do this. this. <laughs> $60 million. <laughs> we'll do this cheap. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a bargain. We're yeah. practically donating our work. Because <laughs> we're going to have to pay a lot to get those actors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you... They've done dumber things than that. Universal Studios has made way stupider gambles. Oh yeah, if you if you if you, I don't even know how they would uh, pitch it uh, mm-hmm. to the public, but it would just be like a cool, you know, Wolfman prequel. I think yeah. I think it's got legs. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we're we're in the story segment. Let's talk about yeah. uh, Andrew Kevin Walker wrote the original screenplay, um, and then when Joe Johnston came on board to. Uh, to the to the movie, he brought in David Self to do a, a rewrite on it. Um, it does have a little bit of that sense of too many hands. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like too many hands in the in the kitchen. There isn't a purity of vision, mm-hmm. but I always feel that way when it's a remake. Yeah, yeah. It's a there's just certain things that feel under underserved like i don't know if it's because they were pared down from one script or if they Mm -hmm. were inserted whatever it is but you know like emily blunt's storyline feels underserved or hugo weaving feels underserved like there's just yeah there's those characters those characters were also really interesting and i wanted i wanted more from them because yeah i mean they obviously got amazing actors to play those roles yes we could have got a little more it was because it'd been so long since i watched this as people are introduced i was like going oh shit emily blunt's in this Mm -hmm. oh hugo weaving is in this like what this how'd they get all these people this is a great cast yeah they got it they got a killer cast it's it's kind of like we needed more mina harker we need more of these side characters yes yeah i could have stood to have um more more of the the romance and stuff built up with uh with emily emily blunt's character um because they need to be by the time we get to the end of the story, they need to be believably in love. Yeah. Um, and so we just didn't get enough of that. And I could have done with more of Hugo Weaving hunting the werewolf too. Like, and I want a sequel. Hugo yeah. Weaving, Werewolf Cop. It does. It does <laughs> set up a sequel. Like it. You even have like that kind of howl at the beginning of the credits. Yeah, it's which so very good. much implied there's another there's a new well, werewolf. We know he got bit and he lived. So yeah, yeah there's definitely another werewolf. There always is another one. You can't, yeah, you can't get rid of yeah. them. They're like cockroaches. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit more about Joe Johnston because um, I think he's a really interesting director. Uh, I know him from doing like The Rocketeer and Captain America. Those are okay. the movies that I know him from, um, which are both period set in the 30s and 40s yeah. movies. So obviously he's a guy with a lot of affection for this time period not not the victorian time but the time that the wolfman came from the 40s yeah yeah so it like yeah of course this guy that made the rocketeer is into old monster movies that just makes absolute sense sure. to me yeah um and he came up from lucasfilm that's where he started his career at as a visual effects artist interesting and he has an understanding of visual effects that most directors don't have like sort of like 
he gets effects the way Chad Stahelski gets action. Do yeah, you know what I mean? Coming like, from being a stuntman. Yeah, yeah, he's like, he's like, I know how to how you use special effects. I know. And he really uses them tastefully in this yeah. movie. It does not come off as cheesy or lame. And he weaves in and out between digital and practical in mm-hmm. a way that a lot of directors can't do. He he knows where where to make the cuts and everything. So yeah. I really appreciated that. I agree. I think that he did a really good job. I don't really know anything about uh, Joe Johnston, but I I'm a fan. I mean, yeah. I like I like The Rocketeer quite a lot. That was a great movie, mm-hmm. um, and and I thought that this one this one really looked like it was made with a lot of care. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And he came on late. If you get hmm. into this, the original director walked from the project. Um, like three weeks before it was it was supposed to start, and they brought Johnston in, like hit the ground running. We were making this movie in three weeks. Wow! And I can't imagine doing that. Yeah, you got to be a real pro. That's like that's not uh, that's not an easy thing to do. To and he just just did it because if you if you spend a lot of money and you drop a stinker, mm-hmm. it just stains your career. Yeah. Well, and this this movie, to be fair bombed like this was not but a, it's a good movie yeah but it, it i mean look at the reviews this is a divi- very divisive movie okay. not everyone's on board with us interesting so as far as the way this movie looks mm-hmm. um i mean you can't say enough about the sets yeah it's they chose the perfect place they spent the money where they where they needed it uh rick heinrichs is the production designer um and he's he's best known for Tim Burton's Sleepy Hollow, mm-hmm. and you're like, okay, yeah, you get the Sleepy Hollow guy. That that totally makes sense. And it it has such a dark, foggy, moonlit, mm-hmm. spooky atmosphere all the time. It's just it's just awesome. Even in the day, the place is spooky. Yeah, and they did a really he did a really good job of recreating in a more realistic way the locations from the the original 41 film hmm. like um the the romani camp like their their caravans and everything uh look they look like you know the similar woodworking and stuff on them yeah. or the conliff antique store looks like the store but like but more real like movies from the 1940s nothing looks real everything's on the universal back lot and yeah. in sound stages nothing looks lived in um it's like they took they took those things and like what if this was a real place but with that floor plan and that fireplace yeah i think that the sets and uh, and production design was really great mm-hmm. and and along with that the costuming yeah holy smokes that was so good yeah academy award winner uh melena canonero is the costume designer and yeah mm-hmm. Superb. It's, it's all super historical. There's a couple of modern, uh, a couple of modern things here and there, but it's, it's nothing glaring. It's yeah. almost all really, uh, really well done, properly cut clothes. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm super into this look. This is yeah. a style that I'm very much interested in. Yeah, and um, I mean, one thing I don't care for about the the visual of the movie is that that sort of underworld style digital gray wash that everything has over the top of it Uh, because when you look at like set photos and and pictures of these costumes under like real light and not not with the colors sucked out of them there's so much detail that we lose like in like uh emily blunt's like the beading on her bodice and stuff like it and it's like this kind of crushed blue velvet with delicate black beadwork all over it and it's like i couldn't see that in the movie and it's yeah it's extremely desaturated yeah and and it makes it it makes it all have like kind of a a, not quite monotone Mm -hmm. but it's a lot more grayscale than color yeah and i mean it's obviously in color but there's there's it's not vibrant at all it's a choice and it was very common in that era in that decade to do this Mm -hmm. And it's definitely the look that the Underworld movies had, which would have been the most successful sort of... they, like, turn up the contrast super high. Whites are white and blacks are black, and it's just super contrasting. This is a lot more gray and desaturated tones. But, yeah, Mm -hmm. I agree. They definitely didn't let any of the richness of any of the colors shine through. Everything seems... uh, Every person seems pale and peaked. Yeah, Um, which... 
that also works. I mean, it does create an atmosphere. I mean, yeah. I'll give him that. And it it's intentional, you know, so it's just um, it's just not my favorite choice. Another thing that I wanted to comment on here was mm-hmm. their uh, their camera work. The yeah. they did a ton of handheld camera work mm-hmm. so that it would give you that sense of immediacy. It's yeah. not Blair Witch like, no, but there's definitely motion like a person is moving. Like you feel like you're in the hunt. Yeah, you're either sometimes you're the werewolf, sometimes you're the victim. Yeah. And it's because of that real, there's, it's not steady cam all the time. Right. And that's great. Um, and then another thing that he does with that is he uses Dutch angles a lot mm. in order to create a weird sense of unease. Like you see something that just, it's just, it's kind of wonky. I didn't even know what that was called. I was yeah. like, what do you call that when you frame something uh, at a weird angle a in order angle, to make yeah. people feel off Mm -hmm. and it's called a dutch angle and i learned something uh but (laughs) i identified it and i was like they're doing that on purpose they want me to feel off kilter and on my on my back foot yeah and it's super effective yeah and so uh shelly johnson is a cinematographer and he is uh he is joe johnston's go-to cinematographer they've uh most of Johnston's movies, he's the cinematographer on. Okay. And these two guys, um, sometimes you get, you just get two guys like that and they sync up and their mm. vision becomes one. And it's, uh, it's just really good when, when yeah. you have people that you collaborate with like that. Um, and it's, I think the cinematography, like, uh, it's eerie. It, it evokes the classic, the universal movies and the hammer movies, but it also like, it's got that strong Coppola influence on it. Um, and I just, yeah, I'm on, I'm completely on board. I, I, I very much dig the cinematography. It's, it's really, it's really good. And Mm -hmm. the other thing that kind of uh, hit me was the way, uh, the way they use lighting. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of darkness and shadow, But it's not so over. It's not so overdone that you can't see stuff. Yeah, that's a thing that they do way too often nowadays in the 2020s, mm. where it's just shit is dark. Dark, it's you can't too- see anything. This movie gives you a sense of darkness, but you can see everything. You can still see it. That's true. Yeah, that is um, because uh, they light movies a lot of times now in a way that makes sense in a movie theater and not in a home theater. Yeah. Um, so that like people at home, like that was the thing Game of Thrones kept getting into, right? Where people are like, I can't even see this show. Yeah. Uh, because <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, we we made it to be watched in a theater. It's like, well, I don't have one yeah, of No those. one watched it's a it TV, in a theater. It's a yeah. TV show. <laughs> you know, it's, so make it to, to be watched on a TV. Yeah. You know, I was on on that subject. How much eye strain do you think people in Victorian times like had all the time? Oh, just because there's no electric lights. Yeah, because and... I was thinking when Hugo Weaving he sits down in the pub, and it seems very much like the pub from American Werewolf in London. It does. Yeah, yeah. and he sits down and he opens up the to read his newspaper, and I was like, God damn, trying to read a newspaper in that in room. That, yeah, and I was like, Oh, how do you how do you do it? But it just would have been normal. Everyone did that like a single candle on the table and, yeah. and you and you read and it's like you know yeah. i went to a couple of super old pubs when i went to london last mm-hmm. spring and obviously they have electric lights now yeah. but um yeah it's those pubs still exist that are mm-hmm. like that and it's like with the timber frame and the yeah. low ceilings and stuff it's it's pretty it's pretty cool that that stuff has been uh kept around so yeah. they could film in those places yeah. you know and and it's didn't have to be recreated that's one of those things they uh saying i always like um i i got it from neil gaiman but he didn't originate it it's that uh america is a place where 100 years is a long time mm-hmm. and england is a place where 100 miles is a long way or oh, yeah. or something like that because like our concept of time and theirs is totally different and our concept of distance is totally different. Yeah, it is. It is crazy. Uh, you know, when we were trying to drive, get a cab back to the airport, Mm -hmm. how far it it didn't seem far. It's like 40 miles. That's no big deal. Yeah. No, that's a big fucking deal. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. To them it is for sure. Getting a cab for 40 miles is a lot. Yeah. Um, they're like, no, no, I won't. <laughs> no, no, mate. I'm not going to do that. 
Um, are we on to audio? Yeah, yeah. So Danny Elfman, right? Danny Elfman, man. I I, I love Danny Elfman. That's just... He sends so many movies. Mm-hmm. And this, this score has a funny story because Danny Elfman scored it um, to an original longer cut of the movie. Oh. Then they cut 20 minutes out of the movie and the score didn't quite work anymore. And he was already on to working on Alice in Wonderland for Tim Burton. Okay. And so the studio chucked out the Danny Elfman score and they hired uh, Paul Hasslinger, Hasslinger who, does the, who did the score for the Underworld movies. Okay. To do a score. He did an entire score to the new cut of the movie. They got it back and it was like an Underworld score. So it's like industrial music. Oh, yeah. And they're like, well, this doesn't work with the movie we made at all. <laughs> What and the so fuck? <laughs> and so they brought back the Danny Elfman score and wisely edited it and trimmed 20 minutes out of it and brought it down to fit the So I want the longer cut of this movie. There I mean it's on Amazon if you want oh, the, man, the if you want the unrated that. cut. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um so that's out there. Uh and the full like if you get the score album, it's the full unedited As version he wrote of the score. It. Yeah. But so much money wasted on uh, commissioning a whole second score to the movie that you don't end up using. I, I wonder what that sounds like, though. I it's guess probably, I could just watch the Underworld movie, movie yeah. again. It's, that's probably a good score. I mean, he's a good composer. It's just the wrong vibe. Yeah. Yeah. But anyways. That's, that is really interesting. Um, I think that one of the interesting things here, aside from the Danny Elfman music, was mm. uh, the... The the wolf howl effects mm. uh, that was they the, they mixed some rock and roll voices. They did. They got Gene Simmons and David Lee Roth, and they uh, they had them howl, and they they did some uh, music magic. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can hear David Lee Roth. I can't hear I can't hear Gene Simmons nah. in that. Maybe some of the growls, mm-hmm. but the the howl when you if you tell me that. David Lee Roth's voice is in that howl. I can completely yeah. hear that. That's a seems like a an early Van Halen outtake or an improv. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought that was a that was a pretty interesting choice. And, um, Peter Stalbley is the sound effects editor and sound designer um, amongst a huge team of sound editors. Uh, it's really cool sound effects. It's very uh, squelchy. You know what I mean? There's lots of, like, there's a lot of blood blood sounds and bone crunches and just, like, gruesome, gross, macabre sounds. And I dig all that. Yeah. The wolf transformation scenes are always extremely visceral in their sound design. Um, Just so much flesh tearing mm-hmm. and guttural growling bones breaking and yeah yeah it was just it was just gnarly yeah. um and and i really I, I really think it it lent a lot to the movie mm-hmm. it, it made you feel a lot more immersed in it they did a yeah. good good job on the sound design yeah and so much of the of the action i mean and it doesn't skimp on the gore like you see plenty of gruesome yeah. gruesome evisceration guy torn in half and his yeah. guts on the ground or like that first uh cop he sticks his fingers up through his lower jaw and out his mouth yeah that's... and like bowling ball hooks him <laughs> <It's> <laughs> so cool. gnarly yeah so gross but awesome I, I i love all of that stuff um but so much of it is sort of it's dark, you know, like, and, and you can't Mm -hmm. really see things well and you just hear the wolf like crunching on something or whatever. And it's, it's very evocative. I like also the subtle, the subtle sound design that they did. Mm -hmm. Like when you're, um, when it's just kind of like a panning shot of, uh, the forest at night near the manor, Mm -hmm. you, you kind of hear like some hushed whispers that are in the distance. It's not in the foreground at all. It just adds a little creepiness factor Mm -hmm. and the, the sound of the night. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just, they do some, they do some subtle sound work in this movie that, that works really well. It's not all just gore sounds. Yeah. It's not in your constantly in your face gore sounds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Are we? Are we? I think we're, we're gonna move on, on to the performances. We are okay. Let's get into it. I think you got to mention Benicio del Toro first, right? Yeah, that's that's the first one on my list. Um, it is such a Lawrence Talbot is such a subtle performance, right? Yeah, it's a lot of it is unspoken. It's just through his sad eyes, and he he's a deeply traumatized and withdrawn person at the beginning. Um, and as the movie progressed, he kind he becomes more and more un, unraveled and unhinged. Yeah, and it's mostly played out on his face, not not so much through through dialogue. Yeah, he brings this uh, like this rawness and this mm-hmm. intensity. He almost feels vulnerable, but uh, also brash about it. Yeah, he he has a very uh, a very um, strong force of personality on yeah. screen, even when he's not talking. Yeah, yeah, because it's a there's a moment um, kind of at the midpoint before he has. Um, I think it's before he's it's after he's been bitten, but it's before he has had his first transformation, mm-hmm. and it's kind of a lynch mob comes for him. Yeah, and he just goes out there unarmed, like you want, like to this whole mob of villagers. Like, are you gonna try and start something with me? Like, he's very yeah. com- He's like very confident about it. I'd have grabbed a sword. Yeah. There were plenty <laughs> there, on the There's walls. like halberds <laughs> and like all <laughs> yeah. sorts of stuff. I mean, those guys had guns, but you know, it just yeah. feels better to have a sword in your hand. <laughs> yeah. No, and that's a, it's a good And when Anthony Hopkins shoots the, shoots the head off of the statue and he's like, I'm sorry. He's like, oh, I'm rusty. I was aiming for your head. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I like that scene. And and that brings us to Anthony Hopkins. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, we got more. More Benicio. Because the other side, the Wolfman, is also him. Mm-hmm. And it's it's the opposite of Lawrence in how understated Lawrence is. The Wolfman's everything overstated because yeah. he's acting through that makeup. Um, but his eyes come through all that time. Like He does the Bruce Dickinson over-exaggerate yeah, every exactly. movement. Yeah, and you know, some people got... Some people got bit. Anthony Hopkins got bit. Um, you know, when the wolf is when the wolf's in charge, stuff's gonna happen. Yeah. He, and Benicio, he goes goes hard for it, and I appreciate that. Yeah, I think I think he did a great job yeah. as the wolf. He freaked out, and you know that's that that's the thing that you expect though. You expect yeah. if someone's gonna play a werewolf, that they're gonna wolf out. Yeah. The other part, the somber part, that's not expected and yeah. i really appreciated that but he's um benicio is a is a super fan of the wolfman oh okay. um, that he signed on to this movie and as a producer on this movie because he was a big fan um and rick baker who i think we we forgot to talk about in, oh. the, in the visuals um rick baker said he he called him benny he said benny would bring in uh old monster magazines and quiz me with the with the <laughs> trivia from them and so like he's a he's a monster kid he's a real monster kid and this is a, a labor of love for benicio well that's great i'm yeah. glad that he's a monster kid because yeah. um that makes me think more highly of him yeah um so anthony hopkins yeah. i mean he has such a he has such a charisma his his eyes uh are so intense and it's different than benicio it's it's just like this um I don't know. He just has this dominance that yeah. he has. There's oh, like that's the this, right word for it. Yeah. This masterful gaze, like he's in charge and you know it. Yeah. And it's true. And he also um, is acting through, a, you know, all that, all that werewolf makeup. But yeah. his eyes come through. And that's those. I, I know I've looked up where he got those scars on his eyebrow. But that really does lend to his sinister appearance. Yeah. Like... Yeah, he just when when Sir Anthony Hopkins stares at you, that's a that's a hard stare. Yeah, I really I really liked the um, the interplay between him and his son, and yeah. how he, you know, there was this there's this deep seated resentment of yeah. his son, and it's it's a it's a very interesting thing to consider how you would act father who resents but still loves his son yeah it's like a weird conflicted vibe and he does it really well it's and it's very twisted right so you have the the relationship where 
Lawrence is the younger son. He is not yeah. not intended to be the heir. The other son um who who died, he was the one that was intended to be the heir. Um but then this <coughs> this Excuse girl me. comes into the picture, right? Yeah. And Sir Johnny says like that's kind of what set him off because he want he also wants the girl. And when the beast took over, he killed his son so that he could get the girl. Yeah. Essentially. Um, and that's such a, it is just such a fucking They all twisted, want the girl. They all want the girl. It's a twisted, twisted love quadrangle that they've got themselves in there. Yeah. And, and he just, he, he delivers these lines with, um, it's, it's like an integrity and a conviction mm-hmm. that, uh, you really believe. And I mean, obviously he's a well celebrated actor yeah, and everybody. another Academy. There's a lot of Academy award winners involved um, in this, but this performance was, you know, it was top tier and he, he definitely was given all he had. It was yeah. awesome. Anthony Hopkins never phones it in. And even when he thinks he's phoning it in, it doesn't come across to a civilian as as being phoned in. Yeah. So like when he's I always bring up the Transformers. <laughs> when he's telling <laughs> you about how how like Bumblebee helped world win World War II and Optimus Prime was with the Knights of the Round Table or whatever. You're like, wow, I'm kind of buying this when Anthony Hopkins <laughs> tells it to me. <laughs> it's like coming from him, everything seems legitimate, no matter how ridiculous it is. Now I'm just thinking of a big red semi truck during the, the Knights of the Round Table era. What do you Or did he turn into a war horse? I, he wouldn't well maybe. I mean because Optimus Primal turns into a gorilla, right? So oh, maybe yeah. he would turn into a a big horse. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's it's hard to picture. Yeah. Maybe a dragon. <laughs> maybe a dragon. That's more Dinobot yeah. style. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's get off of Transformers and on to uh, Emily Blunt as Gwen Conliffe. I thought this character was really great and really understated. At first, I was I was trying to figure out like what are, where are they going with this character, mm-hmm. but I think that she it, she really portrays uh, um, like an intelligence and yeah. wittiness uh, that is it's it's understated. But if you're watching, you can you can just. I don't know. It, it comes through in the performance. Yeah. And she definitely is trying to be a moral compass in this movie. Yeah. Uh, that's sort of her role. But it doesn't seem like that's a role she truly relishes. No. She's she's sort of trapped, you know, mm-hmm. in that um, she feels these obligation from, you know, uh, obligations to this family. Um, I mean, and also there is... There is a class thing maybe that that we don't immediately pick up on as Americans that the Talbots are the lord of their their village or whatever. Yeah. And she is sort of Sir John's subject as well as his uh, you know, future daughter in law. And so there is like Or future Mrs. Talbot, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> if 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 things had gone a little differently. Um well, no matter what, it was going to be Mrs. Talbot, yeah. no matter which one. <laughs> but it's like, there's, yeah, there's this push and pull. And I just, um, she is so great. And her and Del Toro have these really good moments with each other. And there's just too few of them. Yeah, there's a lot of chemistry there. Yeah. And uh, I definitely think that that was cut a little short. Yeah. And there is, like, if you watch the deleted scenes, there is more s- there are there are more scenes with the two of them together, um, and I know I it's it's that it's that push and pull of I really appreciate the brisk pace of the movie, yeah. But certain things I would have liked to have been more developed. Yeah, it's one of those movies where um, it's not a fast movie, but there's still a lot of unanswered questions. You yeah. want more, but you also kind of appreciate how it's going. I yeah. don't know. Yeah, it's tough. It, you got to respect the choices that were made. Um, but I just, you know, I just think she could have been showcased more. And I think that Hugo Weaving as Inspector Francis Aberlane, um could have been showcased more, too. Yeah, I think that he he portrays this, you know, like, sharp, intellectual, like, 
determined cop. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's definitely not swayed by supernatural explanations. Yeah. But he tries to keep his his op- his mind open and definitely he gets uh he gets his eyes open. <laughs> he uh, does. And he he comes on board really quickly after he witnesses the the transformation in the sanatorium. Yeah. Um he gets on board really fast. Uh, and I love I, I love this stuff with him pursuing the werewolf through London. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that part was pretty cool. He's a pretty good shot with the pistol. Like he takes a, the sidearm off of one of like the the street cops and gives chase to the werewolf and and gets some pretty close shots on him. Yeah. Yeah. I like this character. I think mm-hmm. that again they could have done a lot more with it. Now, if they did a sequel, that would be great. Yeah, uh, where he's a werewolf and you Hugo, know Hugo Weaving doesn't. I mean, The Matrix and Lord of the Rings being obvious obse- yeah. exceptions, he doesn't really like to do stuff like that. Like he's kind of a usually a one and done kind <sighs> yeah, of guy. Right. He's got two franchises where he's a franchise guy. Yeah, but those are. Those are big roles. Those are important roles. Pay the money. Yeah. Those are important (laughs) roles. And they're, you know, a wolf man is an important role. He would make it an important role. I think a wolf man is more important than an elf. What would you do? Oh, not an Elrond. That's one of the VIP elves. Elrond is super important, but I mean, in my hierarchy of movies I'd rather see is I'd (laughs) rather see another wolf man movie than like an Elrond prequel. Hmm. Well, that's why no one watches the Rings of yeah, Power. Yeah, nobody watches the Ring of Power. It's terrible. Um, but think so. The end of this movie, uh, Detective or Inspector Francis, he gets bit, right? Yeah. What would you do in the? You got three, three plus weeks till the next full moon. Mm-hmm. What do you do? You know, you're going to turn into a werewolf. I don't know. I think I probably start. Uh, putting my fair affairs in order and figure out a place I can go that's pretty rural and out of the way. That's basically what I thought. I was thinking remote Alaska, get a yeah. cabin, and like, you know, how long's the full moon? Three nights, something like that. Three nights a month, you you just go wild out there in the woods. I mean, you lock yourself in somewhere that you know, you know, you won't, uh, you know, the wolf isn't going to have the acumen to get the key and unlock the door. I don't know. The wolf or seems maybe pretty you smart. put it in a puzzle box. <laughs> or if you're just out in the Yukon or something. You just run. You just run. Just go out and hunt and just be a wolf for three nights. Yeah, but then after three nights, then you wake up and you're freezing your balls off out in the <laughs> middle of the Yukon. You're like three days from your home and you die. Oh, but no, you're, has you're a regeneration. Per- and, and you're stuff. a person in the daytime. Yeah, that's true. So oh, have, yeah, that's true. You can only you can get as far home. as the wolf runs in a night. Okay, that's 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 true. You can always just go back home, get yourself back. Although, promise, the wolf runs farther than you can. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. So it is a bitch of a walk back to your <laughs> barefoot, back to your house. You hope it got distracted by an elk or something <laughs> close by. Yeah. Maybe or, you could bait yourself, like you tie up like a goat or something. <laughs> yeah, I think... This doesn't have to be the end of the road. If you get bit by a werewolf, there's some there's some strategies you can employ. Yeah, I've played a lot of werewolf role playing games, but I've never played one where the change was involuntary. Yeah, that might be fun. Oh yeah, a more traditional horror like, style werewolf. Yeah, that would be cool. And you're like, all where right, where you're you, a true wolf man, and you you wake up in a behind in an alley covered in blood, and you got to solve the mystery of what yeah. you did. What did you do? Cover it up. Yeah. And evade the cops. <laughs> <laughs> because, surprise, you murdered a ton of people. <laughs> Every time. It yeah, just that's not a surprise. It just always happens. Um, any more you want? There's a couple more, like, uh, we talked about Art Malik as, as Singh. Um, yeah, he's great. Great little side character. Or Geraldine Chaplin as Maleva, the, the Romani fortune teller. Yeah, she was she was really intense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she looks so familiar, and you pull up her IMDb, and she's been in like a million movies, but always these sort of little roles. It seems huh. like, yeah. So she's just a career character actor. Yeah, and I was just like, I know this lady from okay, like forty, fifty years worth of movies where she played small parts. Yeah, yeah. 
um, yeah, that's that's basically all I got for performances. Yeah, me too. So uh, what was your personal highlight? For me, my personal highlight, and um, it was kind of funny because I was listening to the score and the the tracks that were the jump out tracks at me. Like I was like, oh, this is a good song. It's a song from this segment of the movie, and so was the other track that I liked. Oh. And that is Lawrence's first trans- transformation. And then uh, the song on the score is called Country Carnage. Mm-hmm. But his rampage basically through the through the hunting party that is pursuing him as okay. he runs around the woods murdering all those guys. So the the tracks on the album are First Transformation and Country Carnage and the First Transformation and the Country Carnage yeah. are my favorite segment. Uh, Rick Baker shows up. Oh, no. Rick Baker shows up in the Ro- Romani village. So Sir John kills, uh, oh, kills Rick Baker. Nice. It's a different wolfman. But... Uh, Lawrence's first rampage is definitely my my favorite. Although the city one is good too. Yeah, the city one is really good. Uh, what about you? What's your your highlight? I mean, you're not going to believe this, but I actually have first transformation and subsequent action scene. <laughs> that was my favorite part of the movie. It's so good because he's like coming, like jumping out of the woods at people, and like it's just such a good. It turns into a, a werewolf slasher movie. Yeah, it's a slasher movie, and there's some jump scares, and there's yeah. some really creepy stuff that happens, and it's really dark. And I, I just thought that that was kind of that was the pinnacle of the movie for yeah. me. And then he wakes up in the hollow of a tree, and Sir John's just looking at him and tells him he's like, "You've done terrible things, Lawrence." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and at that point, I didn't really know that Sir John was a werewolf yet. And, yeah, and, and I'm you didn't get it when he has a like a dungeon under his his house. With I kind of was suspecting something weird, like yeah. oh, what's going on? I don't know. Is this guy in league with the werewolf? Or yeah. you know? But then when he's like, oh, "You've done terrible things," I'm like, "Okay, weirdy, what's <laughs> up with you? You're a really bad dad. Yeah, <laughs> you're you're terrible, and you're a terrible lord because." This guy just killed everybody. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're turning him in. You're letting him catch him. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought that that part, that whole section was really great. Mm-hmm. Um, so what worked for you in this movie? Um, the vibe. And that's a that's a vague way to describe <laughs> It's a whole mood. It's a whole mood. Yeah. <laughs> it's really, it's giving, <laughs> like, it's giving gothic <laughs> horror. <laughs> it's giving uh, Coppola's Dracula. It's, oh, yeah. It's giving, um, you know. Like like I said about Coppola's Dracula, merging the the melodrama of Universal with the carnality of Hammer, mm-hmm. um, and it just it makes this cool vibe. And it's this um, is why Hammer is better than the original. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in some ways, <laughs> I'll give you that. Um, the cast is the next thing: Del Toro, Hopkins, Blunt. Um, it's a fairly lean script mm-hmm. as far as like they don't have. Uh, they don't have a ton of stuff to say. They have to act it all out. Mm-hmm. Um, and they all, you know, give like these really great physical, um, emotional performances. And finally, Rick Baker, Monster Maker. Oh, yeah. This movie got him an, another Academy Award in the same category they invented to give him awards. Yeah. And um, he he really pursued this film. Like when he heard he was at Universal working on Norbit with Eddie Murphy. Ugh. And um, he heard through the grapevine that they were starting production on The Wolfman. And he went after it. He was like, imagine you're you're making the Norbit fat suit. And you're <laughs> like, they're making a remake of the 41 uh, Wolfman. And I haven't been called yet. Yeah. Uh, I am the werewolf guy. I'm the werewolf guy. Yeah. <laughs> and he did this great job of, uh, homaging Jack Pierce's makeup, uh, that he did for the 41 movie, but doing something unique and modern, but still the wolf man. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, there's another werewolf that has a completely distinct makeup and yes. its own vibe. Um, and it's more like the hammer style curse of the werewolf, like with the white fur and everything. And it's like, he's yeah, this was, this was his final movie before he retired. He got an Academy award for it and it's a pretty good one to hang your hat on and be like, okay, good career. Yeah. He, he went out on top. Yeah. Uh, reigning champion. 
What about you? What worked for you? Um, I mean, my first bullet point is the effects. So Rick yeah. Baker. I mean, it's amazing. The Wolf tra- Wolfman transformations are all really good. Mm-hmm. It doesn't get old. Yeah. Um, they're they're all quite excellent. I thought that the. I mean, I hadn't seen the original, and I'd never seen this, and so I really liked the Sir John storyline. How mm-hmm. he, when you get the original, when you get the plot twist that yeah. he's the werewolf that killed his son and killed the wife mm-hmm. and all of that, and then um, you get the uh, you get the backstory of how he got it in yeah. in uh, all of that. I just really thought that the Sir John plot twist and yeah. storyline was really cool. So that's very, just since you brought up the original, that's very expanded from the original okay. movie. He's definitely not a werewolf in the original movie. He's just sort of an emotionally distant, shitty father. <laughs> <laughs> this is a lot better. Yeah, this is, mo- it gives it a lot more depth. And um, you said the vibe, I called it the look. Yeah. I think that the the way that there's foggy lamp uh foggy landscapes Mm -hmm. uh lamp lit two dim rooms yeah uh shadowed monsters and um just uh like silhouettes that are hard to discern in Mm -hmm. the forest just the way this movie looks is gothic horror done right yeah it's just it's a it's uh I, i i mean i hesitate to say uh, too much praise, but I, it's a masterclass in how to make a movie look creepy mm-hmm. without going overboard. It's yeah. tastefully done, and it's, it looks awesome. I agree with you. Uh, not everyone's gonna. Not everyone agrees with us on this movie. They just don't like gothic horror. They're just like. I do think that is part of it. Uh, gothic but, horror is its own vibe. You have to really appreciate the slow burn mm-hmm. and the the beautiful romantic nature of it. It's yeah. got it has to have its own thing. Okay. And then the last bullet point I had here was the costumings and the yeah. s- costuming and the sets. Mm-hmm. They're all just every place and every person just looks awesome. Yeah. So what didn't work for you? Um, I've talked about this a, a few times now, uh, but my number one thing is the the romance is not well developed enough the the you want more booty no more, not, <laughs> it's, i don't need that i need more time with them together being more true love more true love because the the fortune teller lady tells her that the the the, the curse can only be lifted by someone who truly loves the the werewolf right yes. so she has in order to to end this you know, she has to really love him. And we just didn't get enough. Like we, we got enough to sell it enough to, to, to make the movie work. Mm-hmm. But in order for it to be like, to, to get that next level, I needed more of that romance. Okay. Um, I mentioned also, I don't like the digital gray wash, the desaturated, um, colors i think you can you can create that vibe just with lighting and you don't have to artificially yeah uh, artificially do it and i think they did do it with the lighting um so the digital wash to me um is unnecessary and it dates the movie in a in a in a bad way okay and then uh the final thing was i i know uh it was a timing issue but I would have liked even more Rick Baker, more practical effects uh, okay. in the transformations and and stuff like that, because they were digital transformations into a real makeup. And Baker can do. He did American Werewolf in London. He can do it. Yeah. Given the time, he you know probably would have done it. And I just wish that he'd had the time to do it. Okay. Um, what about you? What didn't work for you? So there were a few scenes that I just didn't like the scene. I hmm. thought I, I didn't I didn't enjoy them. Um, I did not enjoy the whole sanitarium section of the movie where they're doing the um, old timey medical malpractice torture. Yeah, where they're dunking um, him in the ice and everything. And yeah, I just don't like that sort of thing. No. Like I don't like it when they do it in uh, Clockwork Orange. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't like. I just don't like any of this where they're someone gets medically tortured i just don't anytime it's in a movie i'm just like i don't like this yeah Uh, it's just a thing i don't like um i agree actually yeah i was like that was not give me back those 
15 minutes and give us some true romance. Yeah, a little <laughs> more. That's that's a part of the gothic horror thing is the gothic romance. Yeah. Got to get a little... And a little... some forbidden love and maybe culminating in a hand-holding. Yeah. Something really Jane Austen. Yeah, because it is like... You're going to feel some type of way of my fiance just died and now I have feelings for his brother. Like, mm-hmm. that's, Although that's super biblical. You're yeah, supposed to marry You're supposed to, yeah. yeah. But it is also going to make you feel a you little... Feel weird, yeah. yeah. You're like, am I doing something wrong? But it feels right, you know? Like, Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're, that's, that's at the core of the era for literature. Like, yeah. this feels right, but I know it's wrong. Yeah. Like that sort of thing. We needed a little more of that Victorian guilt, shame. Yes, yes. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Um, and so I, I didn't like that scene and I wanted more of that. And I did not like the whole gypsy trope. I think it's tired. Mm -hmm. Um, I realize it's, it's very Ravenloft. It's (laughs) very, uh, you know, it's from these folktale type deals, but, um, I just feel, I feel like that maybe just wasn't a very good ad even in 2010. So just for context in the original film, the, the first werewolf is um the son of that that lady okay and it's and he's played by bella lugosi and it's Mm. it's a you know it's a pretty brief role but it's that is baked into the original story the yeah i realize that this is a remake but i i feel like the the gypsy trope thing because they don't call them roma or romani they straight up call them gypsies which is not a polite term but Mm -hmm. that's what they used in the movie which is why i'm saying it here yeah and i think that's tired yeah it's just not needed. You don't need that in order to make an excellent movie. In the in the forty one original, um, because Larry Larry kills the the first werewolf with his silver headed cane. Yeah, um, and then the body of Bella is found there, and basically Sir John plays it off like he said. In the confusion, a gypsy died. What are you know? Oh, what are we going to do? <laughs> just some casual racism. Yeah, it's like my son got drunk killed a gypsy i'm the lord these things happen yeah we're just gonna <laughs> yeah we don't need that it, the yeah. movie was great we didn't need that okay um the other thing was uh a justice for seeing oh I, yeah i, I want, you want more, more sing? sing i want like they could have had more sing in the flashbacks to india i, I, I wish sing was on the roof with a repeating rifle ready yeah. to gun them down and then he dies off screen yeah too. he does off screen i'm like man this guy was cool he could have been this like badass warrior like india yeah. has these this india yeah. has an ancient warrior culture that yeah. is so rich and meaningful it's awesome like he's, he, I love he's, it. He's, he says that thing where he's like he's like a, a Sikh is a warrior for God yeah. and it's like yeah I would like to know more about you <laughs> yeah the, the the ancient Indian and Sikh culture and the, mm-hmm. and the Mughals before them and all that stuff it's really rich yeah I wanted more justice for Singh okay uh, so that's that's all I had I mean okay. just really th- three little things that yeah. i guess they weren't super little but they weren't glaring they didn't yeah. ruin the movie for yeah. me no i'm on i'm on board with those same things all right so what'd you give this as a rating i am shocked with myself because i have done a complete turnaround on a movie that i have <laughs> i have uh slandered for the last 13 years and every time someone has brought it up i've been like i don't like that movie i have to eat that because i'm going four stars okay Dang. So I came into this with no expectations, but I saw Benicio del Toro and then I saw Anthony Hopkins and then I saw Emily Blunt. I'm like, man, this movie is, this is a banger. (laughs) (laughs) I just like, just by the cast. Yeah. And then in the first 10 minutes, I literally typed out, this is going to be good (laughs) because of the way it looked. Like the whole movie looks amazing. Like, and Benicio del Toro's with his like, with his like smoky smoldering eyes and how he's just like, Oh, my brother died. Yeah. You know, like, I'm just like, man, this is going to be good. And it was, I gave it a four as well. Yeah. It's got, it does. It has a sad boy hero, which is, (laughs) that's a Dave go to. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, you're right. The, the thing is, is a lot of reviewers don't like this movie. IMDb gave it five Point eight out of ten, um, out of out of ten. So that's like three stars. And yeah. then Rotten Tomatoes gives it thirty three percent, which yeah. is like it's a splat, like two stars ish. Um, but but 
Google users, uh-huh. uh, the meta score for all Google users, 80%. So wow. right with us. Yeah. So reviewers so. are wrong. Power to the people. We like this movie. So it's really weird. So I went on to Letterboxd and just kind of was scrolling through and reading reviews. And they are wildly like high and low. It is, uh, you know, five-star review, masterpiece, four-star review. This is a, a gothic horror masterpiece, blah, 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 blah. Two star review, one star review. This movie is a garbage fire. I can't believe how bad it is with all these talented people in it. And it's like no, like no in between. So those like those average scores are like averaged out between great movie, awful movie. Like there's very little in between. Those people are gonna eat crow because in let's say like in 2035, 2040, yeah. When this movie say when this movie is 30 years old. It's going to be looked back at as an awesome werewolf movie. Yeah, like a genre classic. Yeah, they're not going to look at so many other werewolf movies uh, that have been out. That, uh, they, they won't hold a candle to this movie. Yeah. No, I actually, I think it has been tracking that way. It's as, got the music. It's yeah. got rich. It's got the cast. It's got Baker. Yeah. It's got, you know, it's it's got it all. Yep. Yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and take a break. And then we will come back with the Vault of Darkness. Before we delve into the Vault of Darkness, we ask that all initiates of the cult follow us on your favorite social media platforms at Nightshade Cult. If you've enjoyed this content, help us grow the cult by sharing it with like-minded people and leave us a review wherever you listen. Okay, so what are you pulling out of the Vault of Darkness? So I have another music recommendation. You've been on a roll with these music, but they've been good ones. I've been listening to a lot of music lately Mm -hmm. just because I've been painting a lot. And when I paint, I like to listen to music. So this is a band. um, This is a mashup band. They take two genres that you don't think go together, and they put them together, and it's fucking great. Okay. Uh, This is a band uh, called Neon Funeral. And okay, the, yeah. the, the EP that they just put out just a couple of days ago is called Band from the Goth Club. Okay. Um, this is a New Jersey hardcore dark wave band. Um, All right. And it's really good. So we're going to listen to the song Avolition. It's not very long. It's like Misfits level of length of okay. this particular track. And uh, then we're going to talk about it. Okay.
So I got this band's uh, entire discography off of their band camp, uh, mm-hmm. which is, I don't know, it's a couple of EPs and several singles, and it was all for like nine bucks or something. Oh, yeah. uh, and I have just been listening to this stuff a lot. A lot of the, uh, I mean, this stuff is really good. Mm-hmm. Um, multiple vocalists. They got a synth player who does all the drum machines and keyboards. They have a guitar, a bass, and then a singer. Yeah. Um, and it's just, this is my jam. That was really cool. Um you know, I'm in the bag. As soon as you do the the 16s on the hi hat drum beat, I'm in the bag for it. Um, and I'd yeah, I'm I totally dig this vibe. I'll listen to to more of their stuff. I'd heard that name, but I hadn't explored this band at all. Yeah, this is a this is a a, a really cool uh, mashup that seems to generate a fair amount of um, like interesting conversations. I read about them on uh, on a a site that mostly does like goth and dark wave music and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, people were like, yeah, you wouldn't expect to like this hardcore influence, but yeah, it really works. And then there's not, I mean, it's it's mostly in the vocal, in the vocal. He does scream a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he screams a fair bit. And then especially in the middle part, he drops into some gutturals that are really low, like, like he, it's really, it's really well done, uh, guttural vocals. And uh, they just, they sound great. Yeah, there's really not a lot of hardcore instrumentation on this one. Mm-hmm. They have some tracks on their other stuff that's a little more, uh, there's a little more rock vibe to it where you get some of that kind of, um, I don't know, uh, screamo uh, yeah. vibe added in. I've never been like a screamo fan, but the, uh, it, it goes well here. Um, and so I think that, uh, anybody that likes dark wave or likes hardcore or likes, mm-hmm. you know, if you like both, that's even better. You should definitely check out neon funeral on uh, Bandcamp because you can get all their, all their music cheap. Yeah. It's, it, it, it evokes a few other bands. Like it, they remind me a bit of that band haunt me that I saw play mm-hmm. with, with Calabrese a couple months ago. Um, Yeah. There's a lot of these bands, like these, this, it always seems like they're, like they're young Spanish guys doing this stuff. Yeah, this is a pretty diverse band. Yeah. Like, um, yeah, they, they've got a lot of, they've got a lot of influences, you can tell. Yeah, it's a cool, it's a cool scene. I, I totally dig that. I don't know how it pertains to the Wolfman exactly. But. Oh, no, I, this <laughs> is just music I like. Yeah. Because uh, I couldn't come up with anything cool. I already talked about Werewolf the Apocalypse. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, I haven't read any werewolf books lately. So I was just like, you know what? Fuck it. The 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 cultists deserve good music. Oh, and for sure. I'm, I'm going to serve I'm, it up. I'm always, yeah. You can't you can't tell about too you can never have too many new bands. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? You gotta stay young. All right, yeah. so do you have something on topic? I do have something on okay, topic. Okay, you gotta save I've got, the episode. I've got <laughs> <laughs> I've got two movies I wanna recommend at, at at vastly different ends of the spectrum. Uh the first one is a werewolf movie. It's called Werewolves Within. Uh, mm. came out in twenty twenty one. Um it's a mystery comedy horror. Uh, directed by Josh Rubin, and it's um, with a screenplay by Mishna Wolf, um, very on brand. And uh, it's based on the Werewolves Within video game, which is one of those, like, figure out who is the the werewolf in the room. Like, you have a bunch of people trapped in a cabin, and one of them is a werewolf. That's mm. the, the, the premise. Okay. And that is essentially the premise of the movie, is that it's a remote Vermont town, and this... Uh, this new uh, ranger like comes comes out there. He's, he's getting stationed out there, uh, played by Sam Richardson, and he's getting kind of introduced to this quirky remote Vermont town. Um, and then there's like a power outage, and everyone is trapped out there in the in the big lodge, and they seem to be all being kind of killed one by one by a werewolf. And yeah. it's like oh, it's a horror comedy, so it's sort of like. Uh, a mashup of like clue and Renfield is sort of in the tone as like trying to solve the mystery of who is the werewolf while people are dying, but it's funny. Um, (laughs) and it's, it's very funny. It's, uh, uh, Harvey, uh, Gillian. I think that's who he plays Guillermo on, on what we do in the shadows. Okay. Um, he's in it. He's hilarious. Uh, the whole cast is hilarious. Um, and there's a lot of, it's very, you know, 
brutal and violent um, and dark humor. And it was just a really good time. It's a, it's a, if you like, if you liked Renfield or that sort of horror oh, that comedy, movie was great. You, I think you would probably like this movie. Okay. And then at the other end of the spectrum is um, Crimson Peak from Guillermo del Toro mm. um, from 2015, gothic romance horror, um, starring uh, you know our beloved Tom Hiddleston, Jessica Chastain, uh, Mia Wyskowski, Wysh- and Charlie Hunnam, and. Okay. Um, it's a, it's set in Edwardian England and it follows this girl who's like, she's a very sort of Bronte Austin sort of aspiring author, you know, constrained by the, the what's allowed for a woman in, in society in that era meets the, her Mr. Rochester, who's the Tom Hiddleston character. Okay. And they get, they get married against his father's or her father's wishes, like that sort of thing. Um, but it, it is a, a dark murder mystery ghost story. Like once, once they get into the meat of the story, it's very creepy. I feel like talking about, um, talking about the plot at all will give away too much about it. It's better just to let it unfold. Okay. What's it called again? Crimson peak. Crimson peak. Yeah. It even has a good name. Yeah. And it's like, it is just, uh, it's a great Guillermo del Toro, ghost story movie like in a similar vein to like his early films like devil's backbone and stuff um i'm pretty much on board for anything with uh from guillermo del toro he's he's awesome yeah and it definitely uh it gets twisted it's 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 a a pretty (laughs) it's it's got some some sickness in it um but it's like if you like that just like creepy gothic horror it's a it's a good it's a good one i thoroughly enjoyed it those sound like uh really good movies uh, yeah i will have to check for the links to those in the the show notes for this one uh they're in there awesome. <laughs> we'd like to thank you for joining the nightshade cult until we meet again we're wishing you unpleasant dreams